Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be with all of you today. And uh, I'll be speaking on the Ramayana today. And uh, we'll try to approach this Ramayana to learn some life lessons. Basically, so I'll, talk, I'll take this talk in three broad steps. One is, I'll talk about the significance of suffering. And then we'll talk about responding to suffering. And then, then we'll talk about rising beyond suffering. So we'll focus on these three steps and we'll talk about this particular pastime thereafter also. Tomorrow will be tomorrow and day after tomorrow. We'll continue this series afterwards. But at this stage, let's begin. So the Ramayana is both a spiritual the spiritual story of the Lord's descent to the world. But simultaneously, it is there is a spiritual spiritual world and there is a material world. And the Lord exists at the spiritual world, Ram, Krishna, all of them exist in the spiritual world. From there, they descend to this world. So this descent is called as the avatar. And the purpose of this descent is twofold. One is to establish dharma in the world. Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Krishna talks about this in 4.78. Dharma here basically means order. And we accept order in this world that the world always goes towards disorder. When the order has two aspects to it. There is the individual order and there is the social order. That means, social order means that society is organized according to what today we might call law and order. So this is where the law comes to paritranaya sadhana vinashraya chatushkuta that he empowers the virtuous and he disempowers the vicious. But along with that, the Lord has another purpose that is to inspire. The avatar is the divine descent. God descends to inspire the human ascent. He inspires us to raise our consciousness, to ultimately develop prema, to develop pure love for God through bhakti and to attain its eternal abode. So this Krishna talks about in the next two verses, 4.9 and 10, where he says that Janma karma chame divyam evam yo vetti tatvataha Tyaktva deham punar janma Naiti mameti so arjuna So that means when there is terrible problems, uh, terrible problems in this world, the Lord comes to fix those problems. However, if we consider this to be material world, the Lord comes at a particular time. He establishes dharma. Prabhuji, you went on mute. So... So what this means is that if we consider there is a cloud above and from the cloud rains come. So these rains are like the avatar. The rain, when the rains come at that time 
there is a relief from any drought that might be there. But the rains are there only at that particular time. What about after that? The rains come and go. But on the ground, say there is a lake that is formed. Hmm? That lake is like the Leela Smaran. The Lord as an avatar will come and go. But when the Lord is a Leela avatar, the opportunity for the Leela Smaran, the opportunity for remembering the Lord, he said the lake is there long after the rain has stopped. Like that, the Lord is there even after he has departed from the world in the form of the Leela that he has performed. And that Leela we can remember. And by that remembrance, we can be elevated. So now what does Leela Smaran do? Leela Smaran does many different things. At one level, it provides us it provides us satisfaction. Just it's sweet, it's uplifting, it's, it provides us joy. Another level, it also provides us guidance. Guidance about how to live in this world. <laughs> so when the Lord and especially when Lord Ram descends to the world. So we will focus on Ram Leela. If we hear the Leela today, there is joy in hearing the past time. But along with that, there is also guidance available. And it's this principle of guidance that we'll focus on today. The Bhagavad Gita in 8.15 tells us something about this world. It says the world, the universe, in one sense, use the word universe in a general sense. The universe is a university of adversity. Adversity means problems, difficulties, distress. And distress is there. So the Gita uses the word Dukhalayam. But the point is Dukhalayam doesn't mean just it is full of distress, it is full of unhappiness, you live unhappy. That is not the point. Just like in a university, sometimes if somebody, I'm currently in America, Americans have this C program where there are very trained uh, soldiers who defend the country. Now they have a very difficult training. You may have seen in movies, somebody joins the army or the country and they have to go through very rigorous training. There are difficulties. So, but when they're going through those difficulties, they're graduating, they're joining an elite squad. So the universe is like a university of adversity. And in this university, when we go through that, it is, we will all go through adversity because that's just the syllabus. So everybody will go through adversity, just like everybody in a university will go through the exams. But a few among all those will actually grow through adversity. And those who grow through this, they will actually graduate. So graduate means they will attain the Lord. They will attain eternal life. They will attain real happiness. So this, in the Ramayana, it is, when every book has its driving purpose. But the Ramayana's driving purpose is that to demonstrate dharma, to demonstrate the, beha the behavior of an ideal person, to demonstrate how an ideal person behaves. And that is demonstrated through the actions of Lord Ramachandra. So Ramachandra, he is God. And when we say he is God, that means he is all powerful. Being all powerful, everything should be possible for him. But when he descends to this world, he acts like a human being. And as a human being, he also goes through adversities. Just like all of us might go through. But he sticks to dharma when he goes to adversity. And by sticking to dharma, he is able to demonstrate to us how to face adversities. 
Recently, I was asked this question. If Lord Ram is God, then how could God not protect his own wife? If he cannot protect Sita, then how can he protect us? Well, that's a wrong question to ask. Why a wrong question to ask? It's a logical question. But the point is, it is not that Lord Ram could not protect Sita. It is that Lord Ram is, through his Leela, demonstrating that even when he faces a terrible adversity, if you look at Lord Ram's life, he is, when he's his birth, it's like, it is said, like somebody might be born with a golden spoon. That means he's born in a royal family, he's born as the eldest of the dynasty, he's born as an extremely powerful king. And he's born in that way, everything seems to be going right for him. And he is the favorite of everyone as he grows up. Hmm? He's talented. He's dedicated. If you consider today's life, so a kid is very talented, it's first in class. A kid is loved by everyone. Like a dream trajectory that a kid is going on. And then he gets married. And I'm skipping over some details because we want to focus on certain things. Married to a to a princess, not just a princess. She's both beautiful and she's also virtuous. So his life seems to be going on a dream chart. And then after that, he is appoint, selected or he is about to be coronated. So till this point, it's like a dream chart for him. Everything seems to be going in the right direction. He is going to be appointed the next king. Suddenly, from nowhere, it seemed as if a terrible thing happens. A terrible, terrible thing happens. What happens? So his life is going in one direction, but suddenly he is exiled. And he's exiled for no fault of his. Now, in today's world, we cannot even think of what exile means. But there's no such thing as exile. Practically, there are no forests in which to exile someone today. But exile is not really a punishment. The nearest we might get to in today's world might be somebody is deported. Say you are living in Canada, and because of some reason the government deports you. But then at least you if most of you are Indian, then you can go back to India. If you're from some other country, you can go to that country. At least we have a home out there. But exile is such a severe punishment. It is you cannot go out with anything at all. You go into the forest. You cannot go into some other country, like not another kingdom. That's why when Sugri invites Ram to come later to his kingdom, Ram says, I have to stay in the forest. So in the among the various punishments that are there, mm -hmm. execution is considered to be the worst. And exile is considered to be just one lower. Execution, exile is, execution is life taken away. So, but exile is everything except life is taken away. Everything except life. And in some ways, you know, when everything is taken away like this, many people would think that, you know, better you take my life away also. What is the point of living? In one, one woman, oh, his, uh, his kingdom, his future prospects, he's taken away. And here he becomes a poverty-stricken person. So, you know, there are many different kinds of wrongs in this world wrongs that can happen to us, they fall in two broad categories. There is adversity, and that's why I use the word, the university of adversity, when I started the class. But actually, worse than that is atrocity. Now, adversity is more natural. Say, if, if our home is next to a flood, next to a river, and the river gets flooded, 
and our foam gets covered with all the water and we have to move away from there. Uh, that, is, that is adversity. But suppose some terrorists blow up the dam and that's why the water gets flooded. It's atrocity. So atrocity is intentional. It is it, done by some other hum, some person. It, this is caused by nature. Among these two, adversity and atrocity, atrocity is actually much more difficult to bear. And among these at least, atrocity to betrayal. That is even more difficult to bear. So atrocity means there is that we have some enemy. Like right now between Israel and Hamas, there is a terrible war going on. And the two sides are have been enemies for a long time. And say one come one side commits a terrible atrocity against one another. It's still terrible. But it's understood that these people are enemies, they are going to do this. But say somebody who's a close friend of ours, and that person suddenly turns against us and they say, stabs us in the back. It could be literal, it could be figurative. It is extremely painful. There are few things as painful as that. And among all the wrongs, Lord Ram, this is what he experiences. That for no fault of his, suddenly his sister, sorry, his mother, his stepmother, Kai Kai, he says, Ram has to be exiled. So, now in one sense, at this point, how could, not only, often the question is, how could this happen? Now, that's the question that comes up when it's well. How could this happen? This is the question which comes up when there is adversity. And when there is atrocity, how could anyone do this? How can any human being do something like this? So sometimes when we in war zone, sometimes we see here very barbaric scenes. How could anyone do this? But here it is. How could you do this? How could you do this to me? Sometimes, sometimes our, our somebody, our sibling, our relative, our friend, they do something extremely terrible to us. And this question can be completely devastating. So in general, so I, everything that I want to speak about how we deal with things, you know, the nature of this world is that I said adversity is going to befall everyone. To use a softer word for this, you can say it is grievance. Grievances, everybody has some grievances. Oh, you know, my boss is not treating me properly. My wife or my husband is not treating me properly. Now from grievance, there can be two distinct trajectories a person can go on. One can, when everybody's a university of adversity, that's what we are talking about today. So, grievances is something which everyone will have. And we consider Lord Ram, what he had was a grievance of, of the kind which few people will ever experience to be betrayed like this. On the moment of the greatest joy, suddenly somebody turns around and takes everything away from him. At least if Ram had antagonized Kai Kai in some way, it would have been different. But Ram has never ever disrespected Kai Kai also. So from grievance, when one goes down, one can go towards vengeance. So vengeance means revenge. So you did this to me, I am going to make it my life's mission to destroy you. And then, if vengeance itself, there are many movies about this. You did this to my family, I'm going to destroy you. And in movies, vengeance can seem quite entertaining. But in real life, it can be very destructive. Now, from vengeance, at least vengeance is targeted. Now, these words might seem a little complicated, but I'm just trying to have a rhyme of ANC over here. So, grievance, vengeance, and then last is malevolence. Malevolence means it is, it becomes indiscriminate. A person becomes an ill-wisher of everyone. Indiscriminate. It's not targeted. It's the ill-wisher of everyone associated 
with something. So this is the trajectory Krishna describes in 16.11 to 15 in the Gita. That everybody has some reason to feel dissatisfied in life, but there are some people, they start going on a dark, dark track because of that. So now if you consider, I will not contrast here Ram with Dravad because that, that is often done. And we understand that Ram uh, is virtuous, Ravan is vicious. But let's compare Ram here with Duryodhan. The different epic, but I'm, I'm a specific reason to do this comparison. See, what happens is, as I said, Lord Ram was about to become the king and suddenly he's exiled to the forest. Now for Duryodhan, what happens? He is born as a prince and he's expected to become the king and then suddenly the Pandavas come back home. And because Yudhishthira is slightly older than Duryodhan, then Duryodhan's claim to the throne becomes uncertain. When claim to the throne becomes uncertain, what happens? He goes to the extent where he immediately decides to destroy Pandavas. And he is barely a teenager and he makes a conspiracy to poison Ima. Some people say that with respect to Duryodhan, that he was a actually he was a good person and Shakuni made him bad. Well, no, not really. When Duryodhan arranged to poison Bhima, it was all on his own. Shakuni had not yet come into the picture directly. So it is not that Duryodhan was good and Shakuni made him bad. That Duryodhan was bad and Shakuni made him worse. So what happens is that first he tries to kill Bhima. When that doesn't succeed, he decides to burn all the Pandavas alive. He doesn't burn all of them. He also decides to have their mother killed. Now Kunti had never been anything but kind to him. Even from Kshatriya standards, women are not to be harmed. So what happened to his, his moral compass has completely removed. You know, even among when people are killed, the most painful form of death is through burning. Because when somebody burns, if they, a bullet or a knife, it just goes into one part of the body and it destroys the body. But burning means the entire skin, pain is felt all over the body. In the most beastly form of killing among various killings. So, so Ram, for example, his throne was taken away. Duryodhan, his throne was only threatened to be taken away. There was no certainty that Yudhishthir would take away his throne. But what he did was he went down this path. Vengeance and malevolence. So now if we go, we all will have some grievances and we can think, you, this person did this to me, therefore I'm going to destroy this person. And once we get into that, Okay, and destroy this person because this person is causing problems. We may destroy that person, but then always our mind will find somebody else. Oh, this person is the problem. Let me destroy that also. And destroy that also. You may destroy everyone connected with that person. So most of us may not go down to the drug trajectory, but we quite often stay caught in this direction. That's how most of us will stay trapped. And a few of us may go down this direction towards malevolence also. But the Ra Lord Ram demonstrates a different trajectory. What is that? From grievance, there is tolerance. And from tolerance, there is transcendence. I'll explain what this means. And then that will be the uh, second half of the, the final part of the class. So what does tolerance mean? Hmm? And how, how does Lord Ram exhibit this tolerance? Sometimes tolerance is mistaken to be passivity. Oh, whatever whoever is doing, I just tolerate passivity. But that it is not it is not equal to passivity. Why is it not equal to passivity? Because tolerance is not just letting people walk over us. Tolerance essentially has two big two aspects to it. There is basically small things small and how do we keep small things small but we keep 
big things big. So basically, while these are one and two, and they're two distinct components, but they're also related. That means we keep small things small so that we can keep big things big. And when you keep big things big, keeping small things small is easy for us. So in the case of Lord Ram, how did he exhibit tolerance? So for him, the kingdom itself was a small thing. For him, his, in that case, the family harmony, his duty to his father, these were the big things. That's why when Ashwat called Ram to his palace, at that, uh, at that time, just before the coronation, and he entered into the room, and immediately he could sense the tension between Dashrath and Kaikai. Kai. Sometimes we enter into a room, the atmosphere itself seems to be so tense or so cold. So just by being there, we feel as if all the oxygen from our air is going away, our ground isn't going away. So it all he could sense the tension. And then the Maharaj is so shocked by what Kaikai Kai was demanding, by what he had to do. He just couldn't function, couldn't speak any words. But that became, Tantham, no, what can I do for you? And when he spoke this, it was Kaikai Kai who spoke in a very cold voice. Based on a promise that your father has made to me, he has given me two blessings. You will go to the forest for 14 years and that will become the king. And then the natural tendency is, oh, aren't I? How can you do this to me? The natural human tendency. But what did Lord Ram do? Lord Ram did something. He said, okay, okay. I always thought of you as my mother. And I thought that you also treated me as your son. Today it causes me great pain to know that you never really thought of me as your son. If you had seen me, and now Kai Kai became tense, but she was expecting Ram will criticize her for what she was doing. But instead, when Ram spoke, for such an insignificant thing as a kingdom, why did you even have to go to my father? You could have told me and I would have immediately given the kingdom to you. I was not expecting to hear this at all. So, within his Leela, was he, with, as a human being, was he shocked? Was he distressed? Yes, he was. But he did not let his feeling come in the way of his duty, come in the way of what was the right thing for him to do, his responsibility. And then Lakshman was enraged at this time. Lakshman said, This is generally what happens is when we are angry, we want to find somebody to blame. So he tried first to blame Tatsurath only. He said, The king has become blinded by lust for his youngest wife. And therefore, he has no idea of what is right and wrong. Says, we should fight against such a king. And then, at that time, the Lord, Lord Ram said, I was with, with Maharaj. So, oh, Lakshman, don't speak words like this, expressing opinions. You don't know what is the reality. I could see from Dashrath's expression that it was not infatuation that was motivating. It was obligation. Oh, he was bound because he had given his promise to Kaikai. Kai. Lakshman was still very angry. How come we had never heard over such a, such a promise till now? And even if he had given such a promise, how could Kaikai Kai ask this from you? Oh, when have you harmed her? How can you do this? Lakshman said, oh, oh, Lakshman, don't speak badly about Kaikai. Kai. She, she loves me. Can't you remember how she used to love me? Her love for me was like the Ganga flowing constantly. 
Sometimes what happens is, say when we are going through life. So if I am here, and then the person next to me over here, and now this person, so this is me, and this person is being cruel to me. Now we may only look at this person, and how is this person acting like this? We may think. But what Lord Ram is doing is, Lord Ram is taking the memory backwards. And he is the, the past version of this person. Or uh, people, and what people are in the moment is not necessarily who the people really are. So Lord Ram is trying to decrease Lakshman's anger by telling, don't think of just how Kaika is acting right now. Remember who she is and how she has acted in the past. Lakshman is still very angry. And he takes Ram's metaphor only and tries to turn it against. That is what I can't understand. If our love for you was like the flowing Ganga flowing, Ganga dry up in one night. It is when Lord Ram states, when we can't understand what is happening, when we can't make sense of the things that are happening, he says it is best to attribute it to destiny. That's why I felt it is not Kaikai acting, it is destiny acting through Kaikai. So basically, generally speaking, say when I do an action, we get a result. So if we do an action worth some 10 units, it's positive 10, we expect a result of positive 10. But say, if I do an action which is 100 positive, and then the result I get is 1,000 negative. You may say, I did so much good, and why am I getting something terrible like this? So what Lord Ram is saying is, at this time, we need to look at our past. Maybe there is something from our past that is coming. And that is combining the present action. This is destiny. So Lord Ram is saying that so this is not Kaikai Kai doing, it is destiny doing. Now destiny may be acting through Kaikai. Kai. The Lord Ram is trying to see a bigger picture. He's trying to see a higher picture over there. So now Lakshman is still not accepting this. And Lakshman says, it is only cowards who accept injustice to be destiny and succumb to submit to it. Heroes fight against injustice. What is happening to you is injustice and you must fight against it. So at this time, Lord Ram emphasizes what is in his heart. He said, for me, the most important thing is my duty to my father. As a service to my father, I was going to climb the throne. I was going to become the king. And as a duty to my father, now I will go to the father. So, here, in the sense of duty, or the sense of responsibility, that is what Lord Ram is emphasizing. Now, when I said that from grievance, there is tolerance. Tolerance means keep big things big and keep small things small. So even when Lord Ram went to the forest, sometimes you know we may accept or some somebody has done something bad to us, but internally we are so resentful that we want to hit out at that person, we want to hurt that person. So we may bad mouth that person to everyone. But Lord Ram told everyone, the citizens were coming with him or complaining about the viciousness of what has happened to him. Lord Ram said that, now that I am going away, my father will need your support more than before. Please support him. You can serve me, you can please me, by maintaining harmony in the kingdom and serving my father. Be with him to support him in his moment of great distress. The normal tendency is 
we just feel sorry for ourselves. Oh, something so bad has happened to me. Something so bad has happened to me. But nowadays, as we know, that there's a lot of mental health problems. Mental health problems can be a, by various causes. But there is this one very common or common denominator for mental health problems. Excessive self-obsession. That means if I'm only thinking about myself and my feelings all the time, this is almost a sure predictor of unhappiness. I'm always thinking, oh, you know, this person did this to me and that person did that to me and that person did that to me and life did this to me. And it's always thinking about ourselves. That is a sure formula for unhappiness. So Lord Ram's focus is not on what has been done to him. He's showing by his focus, he is taking away everyone's anger. Even when uh, it comes to meet him and Bharat goes back with the Padukas, and that's when Lord Ram pulls Bharat over and says, don't blame Kai Kai for what has happened. She was only an instrument of destiny. So he tries to avoid any kind of animosity between the family at all. So he is not thinking about himself. He's thinking of a purpose bigger than himself. That's how the unhappiness can be removed. So now, uh, so what is he doing? He's tolerating. Now, how is tolerance possible? I said, even there is grievance. We can keep small things small, tolerance. That is through transcendence. Transcendence means that we transcend, we go beyond. See, we can go beyond suffering by having a higher purpose for our life, by pursuing a higher value in our life. So Lord Ram, the, high, the higher value for him was that, okay, I need to take care. I need to do my duty as a son, as a member of a family, whatever it is. This tolerance, so the grievance to tolerance comes through intelligence. Okay, what is the big thing? What is the small thing? I'll keep the big thing big, I'll keep the big, small thing small. But transcendence comes by taking responsibility. When we are taking up responsibility, that what does responsibility mean? When a bad thing has happened, rather than resenting what is the bad, why this bad thing has happened, we focus on how can I make things better. Now that this has happened, what can I do to make things better? And this is the mood, essentially, with bhakti. Service attitude means that we understand that the Lord has a plan for our lives. And because there is a higher plan for my life, let me see how I can participate in this plan. So this particular trajectory, does this mean that people can misbehave with us, people abuse us, people exploit us, and still we tolerate? No, no, that's not the point of only. You see the same Lord Ram, now we say he dealt with one way with Kai Kai. Mm -hmm. That means he has tolerated her. He didn't try to hit back at her. But his dealing was another way with Ravan. When Ravan abducted Sita, he did not think, oh, this is my destiny. Let us stay abducted. He did not say that, okay. He did not, he was not passive. Why in both cases, the important thing was a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty. What is the right thing to do in this situation? So, even with respect to Ravan, Lord Ram did not go in the direction of vengeance and malevolence. Why not vengeance? Because he did not destroy all of Lanka. He gave Ravan many chances. Just return Sita, we can avoid the war. And then eventually, sometimes when one country wins over another country, they just destroy the entire country completely. But Lord Ram did not do that. After Ravan was killed, he appointed another person from Lanka, Vishan as the commander, as the king over there. So it was not vengeance, it was not malevolence at all. The point is, some, 
रावण वॉज नॉट रेडी टू चेंज वॉज नॉट रेडी टू रिफॉर्म वेर एज फॉर फॉर रावण ही वॉज अबिचुअल रॉन्ग डूअर ही वॉज समन वॉज डूइंग रिपीटेडली अगेन एंड अगेन रॉन्ग कई कई वॉज अकेजनल नॉट इवन ऑकेजनल एक्चुअली जस्ट अ वन टाइम रॉन्ग डूअर So Lord Ram is tolerated. Now, in the case of case of how he dealt with Ravan, the again the purpose was his duty. Now I have to protect my wife, but that doesn't mean I have to go about destroying all the Rakshasas. Only those Rakshasas who are stopping me from doing my responsibility towards Sita, I will, I will, I'll punish them. So he had to punish Ravan. So it was not out of vengeance at all. You did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. Not like that. It was what you did was wrong. It will stop. If you stop doing the wrong, then there will be no punishment for you. But if you insist on doing the wrong, then you will have to be punished because the wrong action has to be stopped. So here, what did Lord Ram do? We'll try to summarize this in three broad points, and for us in our life, and that will be the concluding part of the talk. That how do we go up? Is there from grievance towards tolerance and then transcendence? How do we go on this journey? So I'll talk an acronym: ACT. Hmm? A is accept. What do we accept? That distress is unavoidable. Everybody is going to face distress in life. For the some of us, it may come from a family. Some of it may come from colleagues. Some of it may come from a neighbor. Some of it from politicians. Some of it from neighborhood criminals, terrorists, whatever it is. Or it may come from our own health issues. Distress is unavoidable, and that is what Lord Ram also demands. He is God, but when he descends to this world, and he goes through distress, and as I mentioned, it is the distress of the magnitude which few of us will ever have to suffer through. So accept that distress is unavoidable. That means when we make decisions, if we, if our decision is based on avoiding or escaping distress, then we are constantly looking for shortcuts. Hmm? Those don't work. Don't don't be constantly looking for which is the path of least trouble for me. I'll take that path because life in the trouble, the life trouble is unavoidable. This does not mean that we just have to live passively with trouble. That brings us to the next part. P is cultivate. Cultivate a purpose so meaningful that it raises us above distress. We can't avoid distress in life, but we all can find a purpose for our life. And that purpose can make distress bearable. So decisions need to be made based on cultivating a higher purpose. Now we all may have some purpose in our life. Say we may may not like our job, but the job pays well. We think, okay, I don't like this job, but I'm able to take care of my family. Mm -hmm. I'm able to get some financial stability. Therefore, I'll take care of this job. So the job is distressful, but the purpose is what enables us to maintain, to it, to tolerate the distress, to make the distress bearable for us. Now that is good to have that kind of purpose, but the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedic scriptures describe that artha. Artha basically means meaning and purpose, or rather, meaning that comes from purpose. The word artha is, you know, artha has literally its artha kya hai? That is meaning. But then there are four purusha arthas. There the artha refers to purpose. What is life meant for? So meaning that comes from purpose. When we have a purpose in life, so there can be many arthas. So for example, somebody is starving. Food is the artha of their life. If there is no food, they cannot survive. And after some time, maybe money is the artha of their life. I need money so that I can move forward. That's all important, but 
you know we need to rise beyond like this there is a hierarchy of arthas and then there is what is called as the param artha or paramarth and the paramartha is the lord it is ram it is krishna it is his service that enables us to move forward in life so when we focus on the service of the lord that is the paramartha why is it the paramartha because everything that we seek as artha in our life it may be taken away from us my artha might be to earn money so that i can take care of my family good artha to have but we are eventually going to grow old and we are going to be taken away from our family sometimes we do something so much for our family and the family doesn't appreciate what we are doing we start thinking why am i doing all this but there is one purpose that is never going to be taken away from us that is paramartha so we may earn money we may take care of our family we may do all these things but we see that ultimately i am doing this in a mood of service to the lord tvameva mata ch pita tvameva tvameva bandhushya sakha tvameva tvameva vidya dravinam tvameva tvameva sarvam mama deva deva that all other sources of meaning in my our life they are all coming from and they are subordinate to the lord so when our mood life when our driving purpose is krishna i want to serve you whatever happens krishna i am your servant i want to serve that in that focus is there then what happens by this is if you consider this is our experience now in our experience say there is some distress so i am drawing this as a red line is this visible to you in mean, here also it's not visible it's visible proji yeah. okay so this is distress in our life now we can't avoid distress in our life it's going to come but when we cultivate a purpose is this line visible a green line yes bro so when we cultivate a purpose in our lives now if there is no purpose then our experience goes in one way if there is no purpose then that distress itself completely fills our experience we can't think of anything beyond oh my life is full of misery this person has done this to me that person has done this to me but when there is purpose in our life then that purpose fills our experience and then even if distress is there the distress becomes small so for all of us now for lord ram through kaike's action there is a bigger purpose that was fulfilled that he went to the forest and eventually fought with ravan and he freed the world from the terror of ravan so similarly for us now now how was lord ram able to pursue that purpose because he stuck to his responsibility our responsibility means not some predefined idea of duty but what is the right thing to do what is the thing that can make the situation is bad i don't want to make it worse what can i do to make things better in this situation so that attitude cultivate a purpose that makes the stress bearable so if we can find whatever situation life has put us in we think okay what can i do to make things better krishna had some plan for my life what can i do in the mood of service to krishna how does krishna want me to act so that i can make things better that is cultivate so accept accept cultivate and the last part is transcend transcend means now in terms of bhagavad gita this accept is this world is dukhala 815 cultivate a purpose that makes distress bearable at 1130 tasmat tumutishta yashola bhaswa and transcend is 1858 machitta sarvadurgani mat prasada tarshi se transcend means what we go beyond transcend distress by immersion in the lord immersion in the lord means we turn away from this world we turn away from this world and we focus ourselves on krishna whether it is chanting the holy names 
whether in the praying to Krishna, worshipping the deity, coming and hearing satsang, by this what happens? This, we are talking about this transcending. So normally, if we practice immerse, immersion in bhakti, immersion means we go deep into bhakti. We absorb ourselves in Krishna. So our normal experience is, this is the world. And the people in the world, this person did this to me and that person did that to me. And then this small thing, okay, the small thing is God. The world is the real big thing and God is a small thing. Okay, God exists somewhere, but this this person acting on the really big problem. But if we immerse ourselves in bhakti, if we do our sadhana properly, we really connect with Krishna. And what happens is, the world becomes small and Krishna becomes big for us. And when Krishna becomes big, and the Lord becomes big, the world becomes small for us. Then the world's problems don't appear that much. But problem. And then, understand, okay, in this world, things will go up, things will go down. Kabi khushi, kabi gam. But Krishna is always there with me. And because he's there with me, I can stay connected with him and I'll go through it. So whatever difficulties may come. We all may have this experience. Sometimes you'll be very disturbed by something and we come to the temple, we come to satsang and we participate in some kirtan. It's almost all that tension that is there in our mind, all the anxiety that is there, it just goes away. Or it just decreases. It doesn't appear so much troubling to us. How it happens is, by the practice of bhakti, especially by immersing ourselves in bhakti, not just chanting as a ritual, but actually immersing ourselves in bhakti, by that, we understand that the world is not as big as Krishna. Krishna is bigger. And then this is a sense of security. So whatever suffering is there, we transcend it by immersion in Krishna. In that way, each one of us can, by learning to act, we can follow in the example of Lord Ram. And we all can graduate to the university of adversity to ultimately be united with Krishna. In this world, and ultimately beyond this world, in the eternal abode of Krishna. Well, so I'll summarize what we discussed today. So I discussed broadly four points. First was the purpose of Lord Ram or purpose of avatar in general. That is at one level to establish dharma in this world. But it is also to show us the path of dharma to go through the world and or beyond the world. Like remember I do the diagram, the divine descent. It's to establish dharma here, but it's also to inspire the human ascent. So Lord Ram comes to demonstrate how to graduate to the university of adversity. That university of adversity. Everybody will face adversity in life. And Lord Ram faced the worst adversity. It's not just a bad thing happening. It's a bad thing done to us. That is worse. And a bad thing done by a trusted person. By a person whom we trust and love. That is the most difficult to bear. That's what happened to Lord Ram. And that's how, how we dealt with it. We discussed that. And that connection. This is the unhealthy trajectory is that grievance will be there for everyone. And some people from grievance go towards vengeance. And from vengeance, they go towards malevolence. I will hurt you because you hurt me. And I will destroy everyone connected with you. This is a very dark path. We don't want to go on this path. The alternative path is that when there is grievance, from there, we go upward towards tolerance. And from tolerance, we go down towards transcendence. So we saw how Lord Ram, tolerance, what does it mean? Tolerance has these two steps. Small things, we keep them small. And we keep big things big. So for Lord Ram, the big thing was to serve his family, to maintain harmony, to do his duty. 
physically when a bad thing has happened, how can I make sure that it doesn't become worse? And the transcendence was through that, through his tolerance, he was able to serve a bigger purpose. Serve a bigger purpose was that he was able to rid the world of Ravana. Now, Ravana was eliminated, not because Lord Ram wanted to take revenge, but because Ravana was not ready to change. Kai Kai was ready to change, so Lord Ram did not punish her in any way. So what does this mean for us? We discuss the acronym ACT. We all can go on this path from grievance to tolerance to transcendence. He was accept that distress will be there in everyone's life. So don't make decisions solely based on how we can minimize the distress and cultivate a purpose that will make distress bearable. And we, for all of us, we can have different purposes, but there is the Paramar, the supreme purpose. That is, I am a servant of the Lord, and how can I serve him? And then finally, we transcend. Transcend by immersing ourselves in the Lord. By regularly practicing bhakti by which we are reminded that, that the world is not as big, the Lord is much bigger. And when we remember that, the world's problems don't appear that much bigger. And then what happens? Even if we are going through distress, our purpose of the serving the Lord fills our mind and the distress becomes bearable. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Thank you very, very much. It was an amazing, wonderful class. And we have uh, the temple hall full packed, jam packed, and everyone was just stunned to see how wonderfully you have explained. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, Prabhuji by loudly chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Ram. Uh, Prabhuji, because of uh, certain time constraints, uh, we would like to do the question answers tomorrow uh, in case yeah. any devotees have uh, questions. Uh, it, it is difficult to manage here also, so we'll, we'll do it tomorrow and then we can take the question answers. Yeah, I'll just quickly mention something that two things that this particular path of why did Lord Ram de deal with Ravan diff differently and Kaike differently? When people hurt us, there are different reasons why people hurt us. And how to deal with different people who hurt us. That's what I'll be discussing in the next two sessions. Now, what made Kaikai do a wrong thing? What made Ravan do a wrong thing? And why did Rod Ram respond differently to them? So basically, when people hurt us, how to respond? That will be a theme in the next two sessions. And so please, if it is possible, you can join online and we'll continue the discussion at that time. Much of what I spoke today is in my book, The Living the Ramayana which is there available. If any of you want, you can have that. There's also a calendar with 366 quotes. This is different from the calendar which I had bought previously. The new 366 quotes. These are all based on the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. And they can help us put uh, put the Gita's wisdom in uh, some it's short quotes in proper in quick application in our life. So hold our plans lightly. Hold our Lord tightly. So we often do the opposite. So detachment is not absence of emotion. Detachment is absence of domination by emotion. So those who can't Facebook, seek shelter in Facebook. Hmm? There are quotes like that inspired by the Bhagavad Gita. Each of these inspired by one verse. So these are all available in case any of you would like to have it. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Uh, the books are, are being displayed at the back uh, in the, in the uh, store. So you all can meet me, whoever uh, would like to have a look at the book, please see me behind. So uh, no, there we'll have the display book as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So another huge round of applause for Sri Chaitanya. So we have to ask the room. The room has been uh, not feeling well, so he couldn't uh, travel. So, but still, uh, despite his uh, uh, ill health, he has uh, come uh, online. So we are really, really, Grateful to Prabhuji, and we also hope to see him uh, tomorrow and on Tuesday through Zoom. Hare Krishna. So, uh, on behalf of Shri Shri Radha Madhav, Lord Shri Naji, Shri Shri Gaur Nitai, 
We welcome you to our Sunday feast at the festival. Is any family coming for the first time? Please raise your hands if you're here for the first time. Anyone here for the first time? Please, uh, many devotees at the back. Please give a big round of applause for everyone who is here for the first time. Like I said, we also uh, welcome you from uh, Lebanon. Another big round of applause for her. We also welcome uh, uh, Narendra Aujala. Narendra Aujala is uh, normally for sky view riding. So uh, we'd like to welcome you. And uh, if anybody has any questions, Prabhuji will be at the back. So you can ask him any questions. So uh, just give him a garland. Thank you, Prabhu. So if anybody has any questions, Prabhuji is uh, leaving shortly. He will be at the back. You can ask him any questions if you have. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Adnan, they are also organizing the radio marathon for our new temple. And yeah, they are also doing a radio marathon on uh, Festival of Colors. 26th. And uh, and twenty sixth. And uh, so it's on twenty fifth and twenty sixth uh, on the Fe Festival of Colors Day and at the Protex office. So they'll be doing a radiothon for uh, uh, raising the fund for our temples. 